Okay, thank you, um, Robert, and thank you for introducing me and inviting me to the, this con virtual con conference in um, Lumini. So the title of my talk is Equidistribution of, Equidistribution of Roots of Unity and the Mahler Measure, and I will talk about joint work with Vessel and Dimitrov. Okay, so let me just take some classical facts. Let's look at how roots of unity distribute in the complex plane. So what I'm looking at here, these points, they are roots of unity of order dividing 30. So they are complex numbers of the form e to the 2 pi i k over 30. And I let k run over all integers. Of course, it's enough just to go from 0 to 29. And I get these 30 dots here. And they lie on the unit circle, obviously, of course. And as you can see, um, they are very nicely equidistributed along the unit circle. And um, the theorem here is that if you let the order or the n here, um, capital N, go to infinity. So if you're looking at all roots of unity of order dividing n, um, then these points will become equidistributed around the unit circle. So let me recall what that actually means. What, how can we formulate equidistribution in a precise way? So I have the same picture with the 30 dots on top. And um, <clears throat> let me just, okay. So what does equidistribution mean? It means that if I have a test function defined on the unit circle, this function f here, which has to be continuous, the complex values, then if I take the average of my test points, of the test points, the roots of unity, um, take the average of this function on these points, and then take the limit as downstairs here, then I'll converge to the integral of the function along the unit circle. So the integral of f along um, e to the, what we've got here, e to the 2 pi i t. So we're running along the unit circle here in the usual counterclockwise direction. and um, this limit exists and equals exactly the integral. So this is a very classical result, and it's also quite easy to, to prove. Let me just give you an idea how the proof works, because we'll see uh, arguments like this uh, later on in a more sophisticated way. So let's see what happens if we take a very basic function, which is just f of z takes f, f takes z to the lth power, where all of some integer. And um, well, now our average here simplifies to this geometric sum here, which is taking the sum k from 0 to n minus 1. And then upstairs here in the exponent, we have e to the 2 pi i k over n. And as uh, one learns in the first year, the first year calculus class, um, even earlier, how to compute sums like this. Well, if, if n happens to be a divisor of l, of course, all terms will be one, and so the average will also be one. And if not, if L is not a divisor, if N is not a divisor of L, then um, ge geometric sum formula tells us that the sum here vanishes. So this is, so in the limit, if we take um, N going to infinity here, in this case, then uh, we will eventually be in, in this situation here. Uh, if L is fixed, and so um, the limit will be will be zero for L not equal to zero. And that is exactly the integral of the function along the unit circle. So if more generally our function is a finite linear combination of powers of Z, so um, possibly negative powers of Z, then um, as I just explained up there, <clears throat> the only term that survives in the limit is L equals zero. And that, cor that corresponds here to the the term a naught, right? So that's the one we get here, right? So for l, for n goes to infinity, this average is exactly the the constant term here in this Laurent polynomial, and that happens to be exactly this integral. So for these finite Laurent polynomials, um, equidistribution follows just by considering considering a geometric sum. And in general, you can do some analysis to, sh to extend this kind of results to all continuous functions on the unit circle. Okay, so that's what happens with um, roots of unity and continuous test functions. We go on. So up to now, I've been looking at roots of unity of order dividing n. So um, 
they're always n different points in the complex plane of that type. Now I want to shift to roots of unity with order exactly n. Right? And as you see here in the picture, there can be a lot less. Here we have only eight dots, and eight is the Euler function by evaluated at 30. So to get the number of <clears throat> roots of unity of order exactly n is just the, um, well, it's just the, the order of this finite ring here, C modulo nz. The, oh, sorry, this finite group, units in C modulo nz. All right, so the number of elements in this group is given by the Euler function. So they're, they're a lot sparser and, and it's not so clear by just looking at the picture that you'll get equidistribution because we've got a huge gap here, we've got a huge gap here, a slightly smaller gap here and a slightly smaller gap here and also a gap over here. <clears throat> Nevertheless, this is also a classical result. Um, so <clears throat> computing the corresponding sum here where you take the average over <clears throat> over the the polynomial Laurent polynomial z to the l of um, the roots of unity of order exactly n. This average can be computed and is also expressible up to sign in terms of the Euler function. As you see here, there's a to the minus one here in the exponent. So if n increases and and l is non-zero, then the value here inside the Euler function will increase, will grow essentially like n. And we, we know also classically that the Euler function here, it grows almost linearly. It grows like n to the one minus epsilon. So this term here, if L is not zero, this term here will go to, will go to zero. And uh, we can also recover equidistribution just like in the um, in the first case. So what is the significance of taking order exactly n versus order dividing n? So the significance is of arithmetic nature. So here um, we're looking essentially at roots of unity of this type, e to the two pi i k over n, where k is co-prime to n. These are exactly those of order n. And this happens to be exactly the, the Galois conjugates of um, e to the, of, of, a, of any root of unity of order n. So this is um, this set is is has arithmetic importance because it's exactly the, the set of Galois conjugates of, of roots of unity. Okay, so for roots of unity of order exactly n n goes to infinity. We also get equidistribution, um, just like in the in the first case. Okay, so here I've got a picture with n equals two hundred forty. Um, so you can, you can now you begin to see that um, we get nice distribution. There are still some gaps here and here and here, but um, they don't matter in the limit. Okay. So what I'm going to talk mainly about today is what happens in in this definition of equidistribution. What happens if you weaken the hypothesis that the test function is continuous? Right. Remember, you have to test your sequence against the continuous test function on the unit circle, what happens if we drop the continuity condition? And so there's a result I'd like to talk about by Matt Baker, Sun E, and Rob Rumley from over 10 years ago, which is uh, also motivation for, for the work presented today. So what they look at is um, they take an algebraic number alpha here, and the test function they have is essentially It's essentially of this nature. You take log of e to the two pi i t minus alpha, right? That's the, the test function. Now, depending on the value of alpha, this may or may not be continuous. It may not may or not even be defined on the whole unit circle because if alpha itself lies on the unit circle, um, you, you'll plug in, you, you'll have log zero at one point, so you have a logarithmic singularity. So nevertheless, they were able to show that if you take the average over um, roots of unity of given order, so of a Gala orbit like this on their left-hand side, and you let the order go to infinity, then this average will converge to the integral. So the same thing you would expect um, 
with, with classical equidistribution. Of course, you have to be a bit careful. Um, this may not be defined for a, a, a fixed K and a fixed alpha, but as we're taking N to infinity, eventually this difference will be non-zero for fixed alpha, right? For fixed alpha, eventually it's not gonna be a root of unity of order exactly N for N large enough. And so this will be well-defined in the limit and the limit exists and equals this integral. Now, as I, I, I pointed out, it depends on the, the, the result or the proof of the result essentially depends on, on the value of alpha. So the, the first case is if alpha is, for example, minus, um, minus um, 1.5 as here. Well, in this case, uh, the function, test function happens to be continuous again because there is no logarithmic singularity as t goes from zero to one. So I've, I've plotted here the function in blue, the lower left, and you see there's a minimum here, it's negative, but it's, it's okay. So in this case, if alpha is not on the unit circle, their theorem follows from uh, the classical result I just mentioned before using those Ramanujan sums. Situation becomes a bit more interesting if our alpha is on the unit circle as here, alpha equals minus one. And you see here the function, um, it has a logarithmic uh, singularity at one half e to the two pi i, one half equals minus one. And so that's where we have the problem. And um, in this case, it's not actually a problem as we'll see later on because um, e to the two pi i, a over n plus one, which corresponds to alpha equals minus one. This um, will be roughly, this cannot be too small. If, if k over n, um, if, if, if the exponential there is not equal to the minus, is, is not equal to minus one. So this will be roughly um, the difference of k over n minus one half if, if the left-hand side is non-zero. So this, whatever happens here in this logarithm is not gonna to be too small because this here is bounded from below by one over two n actually precisely. And um, so the, the, the n will appear here and log n is then negligible with respect to um, 5n because we, as we've seen before, it grows almost linearly. So this case is, is slightly bad, but it's not really bad. Uh, the really bad case is the next one where alpha is on the unit circle like this one here, but it's not a root of unity. So e, uh, three plus four i over five, uh, lies on the unit circle. It's an algebraic number, but it's not a root of unity. So the trick I just explained before does not work. And here you need linear forms and logarithms. So Baker's linear forms and logs. In their proof. So that kind of um, splits this case off from the other two cases. So this case is much deeper than these two cases here. This case is classical. The second case is um, fairly straightforward, and this uses deep tools in transcendence theory. Okay, the, the three important cases we'll see later on when we move to higher dimensional results. <clears throat> okay, so let me first reformulate their, uh, their, their theorem. So it's the same theorem as before in a slightly more general um, dressing. So um, S1, to set up some notation for my talk, will be the unit circle. Um, it has a, a Haar measure. Mu infinity will be the roots of unity in the complex plane. And sigma will always de denote a, an element in the Galois group of, uh, of a cyclotomic field, so which is classically isomorphic to this uh, unit group here. So their theorem can be reformulated as saying, if I take any polynomial with algebraic coefficients, p non-zero, then um, the average of the Galois orbit of the of root of unity over log, so the test function here is log absolute value of p will converge to the integral as the order of the root of unity tends to infinity. So this follows directly from the uh, statement I, I mentioned further up, just because a polynomial always factors into linear terms. Now this integral here on the on the uh, on the right has an, a nice interpretation. This is or as a classical interpretation, this is just the Mahler measure of a polynomial. So there's a Jensen's formula allows you to compute the Mahler measure without computing an integral. It's just 
um, given by this expression here. You take the log of the leading term, and then you add the log of all roots of the polynomial that lie outside uh, the absolute values, logs of the absolute values of the roots that lie outside the unit circle. So this is the Mahler measure of a polynomial. All right. So this is just a reformulation of um, the result that was on the previous slide using um, the Mahler measure. So this would be the Mahler measure of P. All right, let me continue. So what I want to talk about today in my talk is what happens in higher dimension. So higher dimension, I just mean instead of looking at a single root of unity, I'm looking at a tuple of roots of unity here, zeta 1 to zeta d. And um, each of them has an order. We can find a common denominator n. And so the whole tuple has an order. And we're going to say that the order is, is n. I'm going to use a bold face zeta here to denote um, something in higher dimension. And being of order n is the same thing as saying the, that the GCD of these exponents here together with one with n is 1. Right? And computing the Galois orbits of such a point here, we can, we can look at the Galois conjugates of this point. It's essentially the same thing. Uh, we look at powers of um, this tuple where the exponent is co-prime to n. Now, the first thing that, uh, that you see that is in higher dimension, um, just having the order go to infinity is not enough to have equidistribution because um, things can happen here that don't happen in dimension one. For example, I'm just I'm going to write this down here. Take the sequence. Zeta, zeta, where zeta is a root of unity of order n. Then this tuple here will also have, have order n, but it's clearly not equidistributed in, uh, on, on S1 cross S1. So what is not, so the, the Galois orbit is not equidistributed um, on, on Taurus as the order goes to infinity because both entries are the same. So that's something that can happen in higher dimension. You can also have uh, something different, like you have, you have a square here. Um, you can have some power here, and the same non-equidistribution holds. So you have to be a bit more careful in higher dimension, but the only thing you have to make, have to worry about is if there are some relations among these coordinates that are pathologically small. So instead of the order, it's more reasonable to look at the following quantity, namely, we're looking, this in a, in a sense generalizes the order in, in, in a different direction, higher dimension. We look at, for any given tuple, we look at the smallest non-trivial character that contains our tuple, uh, whose kernel contains our tuple, right? We're just taking the, the least non-zero vector b in integral coefficients so, such that zeta to the b is equal to one, and where this notation is quite useful. So instead of using uh, a tuple to uh, an integral tuple is just this, uh, this character notation. So this turns out to be the, the more appropriate invariant than the, the order when looking at questions of equidistribution in higher dimension. So the classical um, fact or result, which is um, stated here is that now if we have a test function on the d-dimensional torus, S1 to the d, that is continuous, then, <clears throat> so there's a typo here. The Galois orbits, the average of f along the Galois orbit um, will converge to the integral uh, of f on, on the unit, uh, on this torus. And here we just have the product part measure. E lambda. And this, the convergence holds as this invariant delta of zeta goes to infinity. So the, having the order go to infinity is not enough, but for delta going to infinity, that's okay. So let me also state that delta of n of zeta is always at most the order, right? Because if I take zeta to the nth power, I get one. So I can, for the, 
and then and then is a, a non-trivial char character whose kernel contains zeta. So the delta invariant of zeta is always at most n. But of course, it can be much smaller than it. Okay, so what is the conjecture that we have for um, logarithmic um, singularities? So, so let's look at this test function here, given by um, coming from a polynomial with algebraic coefficients. The test function is then just for a tuple, we take log of absolute value of p evaluated at this tuple. And so the conjecture is, uh, our conjecture is that if you average um, over this test function, you'll converge to the integral over log of the absolute value of p as this delta invariant here goes to infinity. Now, here are a few words, uh, here a few comments are in order. First of all, this here is the higher dimensional Mahler measure. of a polynomial in t variables instead of one. So this, this integral, even though the function here is not everywhere well-defined on the torus, perhaps, this integral converges and is well-defined. Um, here, there, there's also a question of whether this sum here is actually well-defined or not. The, it's a more serious question than in the one-dimensional case because um, the vanishing locus of P on the torus can be uh, more than uh, a single point or a finite set of points. It could be some, we'll see that later on. It could be something of dimension greater than zero. Um, to show that this average is actually well-defined, you have to show that for delta of zeta large enough, this Galois conjugate here will not be on uh, the vanishing locus of P. And that follows from result of uh, Michel Laurent, um, which is also a, a case of the Manin Monfort conjecture for the multiplicative um, for the algebraic torus. So actually even showing that this um, average here is well-defined for delta of zeta large enough is a, is a theorem. <clears throat> okay, so that's a conjecture. Uh, the conjecture is open and uh, I want to uh, report on some progress towards this conjecture. In the case d equals one, the conjecture is known by the result of uh, Matt Baker, E and Romilly. Okay, so what is what kind of evidence do we have towards this conjecture in dimension greater than one? So we have a result by um, Gary Meyerson from the 1980s and uh, then um, slightly extended by Bill Duke in 2007 of the following form. So here we're looking at roots of unity of prime order. So zeta will be a root of unity of prime order and the tuple we're looking at here is of the following form. We look at zeta, zeta to the a, zeta to the b. The whole packet has order p. And a and b are, well, they're only defined modulo p, which is good enough for us because zeta is a root of unity of order p. And a and b are the non-trivial elements <clears throat> in the unique subgroup of order three in the multiplicative group fp, right? And this, of course, requires us to suppose P is equivalent to one mod three, then there is there's a, a unique subgroup of order three in FP star. Right? Take that group, we take the new, two non-trivial elements, and then we look at this tuple. And then we average, um, we average um, the test function along this, along this tuple here, along this sum. So the, the polynomial here is, is, is T plus T1 plus T2 plus T3. So it's, um, it's okay, it's in dimension three, I guess, but you can you can reduce it to something in dimension two, if you'd like. And by, by dehomogenizing, and the test function here is just logarithm of absolute value of P. Now the, the limit here, so P minus one is just the order of uh, the number of roots of unity of order P. And so the theorem was um, that this average converges to the Mahler measure, just as predicted by the conjecture, plus some error term that goes to zero. And um, delta here can be computed of this of this tuple. And this um, this is actually even a more precise way of of stating convergence here. That the 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 difference goes to zero as p goes to infinity in this in this way here, right? And let me just say. Uh, an amusing fact about this Mahler measure, it was computed by, by Chris Smith to be equal to the value of uh, the derivative of a certain L function at the point minus one. So this value here 
uh, can be approximated numerically, and we see it's it's a positive real number. Let me stop here. So this is some evidence um, towards uh, the conjecture in dimension greater than one. Um, and so as next point, I want to state a result um, for a class of polynomials in um, D variables for which we, we know the conjecture is true. And for that, I need to introduce a uh, the notion of atoral polynomials. So atoral polynomials appear in the literature, um, I guess they appeared in work of Agar McCarthy Stankus in 2006, and later in, um, in slightly different form in work of Lynch, Schmidt, and Verbitsky. And we will introduce yet another variant of uh, what it means for a polynomial to be atoral. And uh, these three uh, definitions um, are not completely equivalent, they are, in, but in similar spirit, I, I could say. Um, we chose a definition that's more um, adapted to our method, or best, best, least, most best suited for our method. So, okay, so let's start out with any polynomial in T variables. And <clears throat> complex coefficients, and we're going to look at its zero set, not on um, the fine D-dimensional space, but we're going to look at the zero set on the torus, the D-dimensional torus. So these are just the and this is just the points where the complex apt value is one. So this is a set. It's not complex algebraic because um, the unit circle is certainly not complex algebraic, but it's a real algebraic subset of, of um, C to the D. <clears throat> I'll, see, I'll show you some pictures later on how, how something like this can look like. And now the, of course, the important feature that we have in the complex plane is that we can complex conjugate. And if we're on, on the unit circle, the complex conjugate of a point is just its, uh, its inverse, right? So if we have a solution of this equation here, and if I take the con complex conjugate of the whole packet, um, I'll be inverting here the coordinates because they're on the unit circle. Now I'll, comp I'll get a complex conjugate here in the, in the polynomial P. Right. So we get actually we get a second relation for any any point here in this zero set, and this second relation may or may may not be independent of the first relation. So um, of course, if if um, for example um, p is symmetric uh, with res with regard to if it's is real coefficients and it's symmetric with, with regard to this inverting operation up to a monomial coefficient, then this will not give us a new relation. But sometimes you'll get a new relation, and, and, and like generically you would expect this to happen. And by new relation, I mean that we get a, a second polynomial that is, is co-prime to the first one up to a monomial. Then, then we'll say that um, we, that, that's a situation we can deal with. So the, the precise definition of atoral is as follows. We say that the polynomial P is a toral if there exists co-prime polynomials, R and S. So R and S are allowed to have uh, complex coefficients again, or if we're working over some, um, some smaller field, then we'll ask the coefficients to be in the smaller field. Co-prime, they're, so they're, 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 they induce different relations, and we want the, the common set of zeros of, um, of the, the set of zeros of p on the on the detours to be contained in the common zeros of r and s. Right? That's what we want. So if, for example, these two guys here, these two relations are honestly independent, then we can we can um, create polynomials out of these two guys. In general, they may not be, and there may be other polynomials r and s that um, are are co-prime such that a is contained in the common zeros of R and S. So this actually happens to be equivalent to saying that the dimension of A, so remember A is a real algebraic set, is at most D minus two. So A is real algebraic, it has a real dimension, the, there's a concept of dimension of real algebraic sets, and um, it's certainly something of dimension D, at most D minus one because P is non-zero as a polynomial, so it's at most d minus one. But if we if it's d minus two, then then that's the atoral case. In a sense, 
being of dimension d minus two is the generic situation because um, if you look at it from the real algebraic point of view, these are actually two conditions, namely the real and the imaginary part of P vanish at the, the point Z1 to ZD. And so generically, you're, you're removing two dimensions from D. But in general, there can be um, polynomials that are not atorial, and I'll show you an example in a moment. So in dimension D equals one, being a toral just, just means that the polynomial does not vanish on the unit circle, right? If there are two polynomials co-prime in one variable, then they will, have not, will not have any common roots. And so this here, this set here will be empty in D equals one. For D equals two, what is the common set of zeros of two co-prime polynomials in two unit variables? That's a finite set. And so for D equals two, being a toral just means that this set here, A, is finite. That's what it means for D equals two, right? And for larger D, um, it's uh, not so straightforward how to formulate that, but for example, this linear polynomial T1 plus T2, et cetera, plus TD is a toral because you can cook up um, two in uh, co-prime polynomials from using this, this kind of relation here. Yeah. So not all polynomials are a toral, even in D equals two, for D equals one, there's obviously cases. In D equals two, you can look, at, for examples, at Blaschke products. And I've prepared a picture or a small image. I hope you can see this. I've switched to a browser. I hope there's no problem um, with screen sharing at this time. So this is um, an example of a, a polynomial that you can construct using a Blaschke product. The polynomial is a form 2xy minus x minus y plus 2. And um, <clears throat> this blue torus here corresponds to the, the two-dimensional torus, S1 cross S1, and the intersection of the complex roots of this two-variable polynomial with S1 cross S1 is represented by this red line here. So this red line or this red curve um, would be so of something of real dimension one, and so this is not an atoral polynomial, this guy here. So this is something that's difficult. We'll see that this will be difficult to, to treat with our methods. So I'm returning to my notes. I hope there hasn't been a problem. Okay, let me continue. So let me say something about what is known in this atoral setup. So, um, in, so this is using uh, the um, definition. This is a result by Lynch, Schmidt, and Verbitsky using their definition of atoral, which is slightly different from ours but which in this special case, I think corresponds to ours, um, at least for irreducible polynomials. They show that if we average over um, this test function here, then in the limit, we get the Mahler measure, right? Um, they're not averaging over Galois orbits, but over finite subgroups of, of this, uh, torus here, this uh, multiplicative group to the D. And they also have a notion of, of uh, delta of G. This is just to mean that the, the points of uh, the this finite um, subgroup um, equidistribute in the classical sense as we uh, run along this sequence. So they have they have convergence for finite subgroups under the atoral condition. So again, if 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 the polynomial does not vanish at all on the, the torus, then convergence follows from the classical results because then our test function is continuous. And there was a previous result by the same three authors in, from 2010 uh, under the condition that the uh, vanishing locus of the polynomial on the detorus is finite. Right? But remember, a toral is weaker. That just means essentially that the, the vanishing locus is of real dimension at most d minus two. So at, starting from dimension three, this is a stronger condition than being a toral. And finally, Dimitrov in his PhD thesis, 2017, he dropped the hypothesis on P, so there's no atoral hypothesis, but he allowed only subgroups of this type, so the n-torsion groups of, um, of um, the roots of unity. All right. So what is our, our result here? So we're back to the, the Galois orbit settings. This is um, joint work with, with Vessel and Dimitrov. And so we have uh, an atoral polynomial. So with the same 
the hypothesis as in um, work of Lynch and Verbitsky, but we're averaging over the Gal orbit as opposed to finite subgroups. And so we get the limit here equals um, the Mahler measure of P if, again, under the, the assumption that um, the Gal orbit actually becomes equidistributed in the limit. Just a few remarks. So we um, we get a rate of convergence that is a polynomial with a small exponent in um, one over delta, and we have a slightly weaker condition on a toral. Actually, it's something that we call essentially a toral, and I can explain that to you in in a short in this short picture. Remember, in the one dimensional case, there were these three situations. So this was somehow the trivial one, where the function is. Um, the function is actually continuous on um, on S1. Then we had the case where the the pole. Oops, there's a small fault, wrong picture here. So this is actually this should be a singularity here. There is a case where there's a pole at a root of unity, which was um, some, somewhat easy to treat. And then there was a case where there's a pole at a non-root of unity, and this required Baker's linear forms and logarithms, or at least some. Uh, quantitative version of it. So in the, the, the higher dimensional case, we can have poles on um, the d torus, but the poles set is not allowed to be too bad. So it's at most of real dimension d minus one. So this is somehow the atoral case. We can also treat this case where the the pole the, the pole set is is large of dimension d minus one, but it's it comes from essentially an algebraic subgroup, like here, minus one is an irreducible component of an algebraic subgroup. This is a case that is conjectural. The, the general case that in the non-dimensional setting requires Baker's linear forms and logarithms is at the moment open in higher dimension. So this is what, um, where further work, uh, where further ideas are needed. And also a small point, uh, we don't need to really work with this Galois orbit, we can also replace Q by a number field stage. All right, let me give you an example of what um, there's a nice application of these equidistribution results. Um, let's look at this polynomial, T1, T2, plus T3, plus T4, and this happens to be a toral. We can just look at these two guys. Um, you invert it, and then they're co-prime as Laurent polynomials, and then you get the two relations R and S. Um, also a nice feature that the Mahler measure here of P has been computed. To this value, it's also, this is um, related to the zeta function. Um, <clears throat> the actual value will not play a role for this work, but what's important is that it's positive. That's, that will play a role. Okay, so um, let's say we have four roots of unity, zeta one to zeta four, such that their sum is an algebraic unit. Well, you'll find examples like this if you, if you look. So you can take, for example, uh, e to the 2 pi i over 6, e to the minus 2 pi i over 6, and then two general roots of unity from minus here, then the sum will be will be exactly 1. So there are examples where this is an algebraic unit. What happens in that case? So we can apply the theorem. The theorem tells us that the, the average here will converge to the Mahler measure as delta goes to infinity. But if, if I'm a unit, then this average here is just the logarithm of the absolute value of the field norm, and so this will be zero. Right. And then, of course, we're at a, we've got a problem. I, as I said, this is a positive value here, this, law, this Mahler measure, and so there, something zero cannot converge to something positive that when both things are constant, so that means that delta of zeta has to be bounded, right? So it's a certain, a certain finite result. So as a conclusion, um, <clears throat> if zeta one plus zeta two plus zeta three plus zeta four are, is an algebraic unit for some four roots of unity, zeta one to zeta four, then there has to be a multiplicative relation between these four roots of unity um, where, where, where the exponents are bounded by some constant be here. And here, the relation is, is clear. I mean, there, there are many relations. So for example, you can take zeta 1 to the 6 equals 1 here in this particular instance, and there are other relations. Zeta 1 times zeta 2 is 1, and so on. So this is a certain kind of finite, kind of finite results you can get out of 
echo distribution statements like this connected to a conjecture of, of Su Yong Yi, which was also a motivation in the work of Baker, Ian Rumley. Okay, let me say a, things, a few things about the proof um, of our theorem um, in the last, um, I think, uh, 10 minutes. So, <clears throat> so let's go back to the univariant case, univariate variable case. Um, so if we just have a polynomial in one variable, let's see what we can we can get there. So the proposition that we need to prove or that we prove in our paper is, is the following. So we're back to the one variable case. Later on, we're going to try to reduce to the one variable case. So we take an average over um, a Gawa orbit of um, or a rate of unity, uh, plug it into our, our Q, and um, proposition says that in the limit, this is the Mahler measure of Q. And the, the point of this proposition is that we get an explicit uh, error estimate here, which is explicit in, in all the data. Now, there is an important hypothesis here. Namely, this is just the atoral hypothesis in dimension one. As you recall, being atoral in dimension one means I'm not zero on the unit circle. So this is where the atoralness comes into the picture. And let me give you an idea how the proof works. So the proof is rather straightforward here. We, we can assume that Q is just linear by factoring um, the polynomial. And then what does the average look like? Well, there are contributions to the average that are harmless, namely those conjugates that are away from um, any pole here, any pole of this, uh, that, that, that are not too close to alpha, right? So there, there are actually no poles here, but still, Alpha could be very close to the uh, unit circle, so you want to you want to sum over first those conjugates of zeta that are not too close to alpha. So and being not too close is being polynomially bounded away here, one over n squared as a placeholder, and then there is a remaining term here of those the, the bad guys, the guys we have to deal with later on. Now because the proximity here is one over n squared, and these are roots of unity of order n there can be at most one term here in this sum here. So there's a one of most one bad guy, and the rest, phi, phi of n minus one um, guys we can handle. Right? And using just the, the standard equidistribution techniques, this, this part of the sum here converges um, rather nicely to what you would expect, namely the Mahler measure of this um, univariate polynomial, which is this log of max one comma absolute value. So this, this, this sub part of the sum is harmless. What we need to deal with is this part here. And, and as I said, there's only one term here, but this, this one term can cause a lot of problems because even if alpha is not on the unit circle, we have to deal with this, the contingency that, that um, zeta or some conjugate of it is extremely close to alpha and will spoil here this absolute value. And so this could be very negative in principle at least. We have to deal with that. Okay, so what is the worst case scenario? It's when our average is um, log of max one comma, so this is the, the Mahler measure here, plus some pathologically negative um, term that comes from a conjugate that is extremely close to alpha. And then if, I'm not going to specify the error term here, that comes from, from, from this one here. So recall that this, this Sigma, this exceptional conjugate is just of the form e to the two pi i q for some rational number q. And it's tempting to uh, apply Baker's linear forms and logarithms at this point, just like in the work of Baker, Ian, and Romley, uh, because we're dealing here with, if you look at the log of this, this would be two pi i q, and log of this would be the logarithm algebraic number. If these two guys are closed, and so the, their logs will also be, or choices of logs will also be, so it's, it's an idea to apply Baker's linear forms and logarithms. Um, but this was already observed by Duke in his work in 2007, that um, the current versions of, um, even the, 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 the state of the art of Baker's, um, even the two variable results, um, the dependency in the field of definition here of alpha is not good enough to get a result here. So the dependency of the field of definition is usually e cubed or something like that, and that will not won't be able to will, will, will dominate this this denominator here. So that that unfortunately doesn't work. So we have to do something else, and what we do is actually something. Um, it's almost a sacrilege. So we 
we have to bound, so the, 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 the thing to do is we have to bound this from below, right? And so what is the first thing you learn at university? Well, the first thing is probably the, the triangle inequality, and then there's a reverse triangle inequality if you just go um, the other way. But of course, you pay a high price for that. And usually this price is much too high in any context, um, in, in, in any applications in, in number theory. But it, actually, in this setting, it turns out to be to be good enough. So um, so we bound the, the, differ, the distance between zeta, sigma, and alpha from below just by the distance of alpha to the unit circle. Yeah, this is um, may seem like a blunder, but it actually happens to work in this situation. And why does it work? Well, um, <clears throat> if alpha, the, the situation that we're interested in is if alpha is extremely close to the unit circle. And if alpha is extremely close to the unit circle, then the distance between alpha and the unit circle is roughly the distance between alpha and its complex conjugate inverse. So if alpha were precisely on the unit circle, then alpha to the minus one complex conjugate would be precisely equal to alpha, but they're, they're reasonably close to one another. Right? So now remember, alpha is not on the unit circle by hypothesis. No roots of Q are in the unit circle. So this happens to be positive, which is already a good sign. We get a lower bound by something positive, but we, we need something a bit stronger. And, and for this, we, we return, we return to, to, to Mahler results on separation of roots of, um, of polynomials. So this is a result of Mahler from 1964. If I have two distinct roots of a polynomial with here integer coefficients, um, then I can, I, I can bound the distance between these two roots from below by something that is essentially linear in the degree and with a dependency on the Mahler measure of f. F. And so if you plug in this result, you can you can um, use this polynomial here where that has alpha and alpha um, conjugate to the minus one as roots. And um, you can bound this difference here from below. And the, the lower bound you get will be good enough for the application because the dependency here in, in D is, is, is essentially linear. And um, that will lead to an essentially linear dependency here in D. And in the end, the, the phi of N will, will win. So for our result, we actually have to deal with different alphas because we have a product. Our polynomial is a product of linear um, terms, as usual. And so we need a result like Mahler, but where we compare pairs of roots um, like a separation result of pairs of roots. And so for this, there's a result of Mignot that strengthened Mahler result to pair to, to several pairs of roots, not just one. So we get a lower bound for, for several pairs of the same quality as Mahler. So that kind of will give us um, something of this nature. The, the univariate case, and then we have to go to the the we have to reduce from the the multivariate case to the univariate case. So now let's assume that P is a toral, and um, we have um, a tuple of order n and um, of roots of unity, and so we can we can reduce to the univariate case just by the basic observation that any tuple of roots of unity of order n is essentially generated. The coordinates are generated by a single root of unity of order n. So I can write um, this zeta, bold zeta as uh, non-bold zeta to the to some exponent a, which which is a vector. And for Galois conjugates, I can do the same thing. And I also have some some degree of freedom here because I can always add a vector, um, a multiple of n, because if n is the order of zeta, then that that won't matter. So using this freedom, I can construct a polynomial starting from p using this exponent here. And the game is then to choose this exponent, choose tau and, and, and b in such a way that this exponent is as small as possible, right? That will give me a polynomial of the smallest possible degree. And, but it will be a univariate polynomial. So we can try to apply the proposition before to this univariate polynomial. The point, of course, the average doesn't change by doing this, this, uh, this process. So we can reduce to um, the univariate case. The, the, the pay price we pay is that the degree of this Q here will be very large. That's why I was very um, concerned about getting 
good dependency in the degree in the last univariate case. So using Erdos tool on Coxma, we can um, get a bound for um, like an optimal choice here of this exponent, which will decay um, depending on this delta of zeta. Right? So we get we get some improvement over the trivial bound, some power of delta. And then we plug in we plug in the proposition, and then well, <clears throat> at least if this delta here grows quickly enough, then um, the error term will be smaller of one, which is what we want. Right? So if, if this delta here grows like n, or some small power of n, then uh, we get convergence here. So let me just um, let me just briefly sub sum what we have here. So if if the this delta of zeta grows quickly enough in n, so like small some small power, then we get a convergence result. The Mahler measure here is again the Mahler measure of something univariate. So we have to as a next step, we have to compare this with the Mahler measure of P, the original polynomial. And um, for that, we need a result of Lawton, or at least some a variant of the a result of Lawton that allows us to reduce the computation of a multivariate Mahler measure to a univariate Mahler measure. And there's a quantitative version of this that we show. Uh, we have to deal with this situation where um, delta does not grow quickly. And the first, the final thing is that we have to deal with um, a situation where um, Q vanishes on the root on the on the unit circle. Remember that was an important hypothesis in the proposition. Without this hypothesis, our method doesn't work. So we have to make sure that the polynomial Q we constructed does not vanish on the unit circle. And just let me say a few words on that. So if if Q happens to vanish on the unit circle, <clears throat> that's where the atoral condition comes into the picture, right? If we're uh, if if Q vanishes on the unit circle, then we'll find a point on the detorus and on the vanishing locus of P of this nature here. And now we use it that that our polynomial is atoral. So this will be actually contained in the vanishing locus of two co-prime polynomials R and S. And then using a result of Bombieri, Masser, and Zanya, we can we can get a we can get a nice bound here on. Um, on something orthogonal to this, um, to this expression here. So this here uses some a result of Bombieri, Master, and unlikely intersections. And let me just go to the final slide. Um, so if what happens if um, this n c is orthogonal to the exponent? Well, then I I just take I can take C as an exponent in zeta, and I get one, and that means that the delta of zeta is at most is at most b, right? And so that means if if I have a root of unit, I have a point on the unit circle that's contained on the vanishing locus of my Q, that means the delta of zeta is bounded, and um, that will mean that well, the proof is over because we can assume that delta of zeta is, is as large as we want. Let me conclude by showing two or three pictures. Um, here, this is what happens. If this is a typical atoral um, polynomial intersected with the torus, this red point, it's a single point. The yellow line is uh, the algebraic subgroup here that appears in bombieri mass We can make it a bit more complicated. Now it's x times y squared. And uh, even more complicated, you see the subgroup always misses this point, this random point. Of course, it could also hit the random the point in some cases. But the theorem tells us of bombieri mass that this is somewhat rare and we can deal with this situation. Okay, so here, to close off, here's a picture of Lumini from <laughs> Montbuget, with Marte in the background from a few years ago. So I hope to return to Lumini soon. Thanks for your attention. Yeah, so thank you very much for the rich and very interesting lecture and for this nice picture from Puget. Uh, Maybe you know there is a fast track to go down just right of this place. You took the you took the picture, which is a really very nice round tour of about three hours from from the institute. Yeah, it's a pity that we cannot do that. Um, so we have still some time for very fast questions. <clears throat> Are there questions, comments? Yeah, there is a question. Can you read it, Philip? 
For, oh, Fabien. Oh, okay, Fabien. Um, <laughs> have you compared the notion of atoral and the notion of tempered from Denninger? No, I've not. I, I'm not aware of tempered, so, but I'd like to look into that if there's a connection. Okay. Then I'm interested in, in Mahler measures. Oh, I'm back with you. 